just as we, um, yeah, I think one of the things that's really interesting as we've been talking today is just realizing how often the Christian life is fairly hard, isn't it? I don't know if you feel like that or is it just me? Uh, sometimes it's like, oh, it's, boy, that's not as easy as I thought it was going to be. Um, there's, there's a constant tension in my heart like between what I want to do and what I don't want to do. Um, I mean, I see constant tension in our world. You know, there's things which are going around that, oh man, if we could just follow the ways of the world, it would be much easier for us. But we know that that's not the way of wisdom. It's not the way of godliness. And, and it's the way that hurt brings hurt and, and disaster. And it's, it's sometimes we're, we're in this place where it's just hard, isn't it? But isn't the Christian life also really good? I, I reflect on our, our discussions this morning and the way we, in, the encouragement and the reflection of, well, but we live with God with us. We live with the reality that even in the hard heart work that we face at times, there's God at work in us. And that's good. God has prepared a home for us. And that as we look into the future, we know that like this, this, this is a transient place we're living in. This, uh, you know, we don't put our hope here. And it makes sense then when you realize that the Apostle Paul will say to die is gain. Or you ma- it makes sense to, uh, to hear him saying to depart and be with Christ is better by far. Not just like, it's not a narrow gap. It's not... Ah, it's just a little bit better than this life. It's better by far. And we, we get to live with this, this reality that, man, this is good. Even though we have a lot of tension, even though it's hard at times, even though we don't understand the hang of a lot. <laughs> and I, I don't know, maybe you feel we understand a lot more than I do, but I go through stuff and I'm just like, I don't know what's going on. It's like, Why? Why? all this. Uh, I'm so humbled by the fact that I don't have to know the answer to the all the why. Because I do know that God is good. And I do know He's sovereign. And I do know He's great. And that's why we've been singing that today. It's, a, it's, it's been about His faithfulness, about His greatness. So, you know, we've just been reflecting on that as, because we can and He is. And this is what we have. And so as we gather for worship together, we, we get to worship the God who sees us and knows us and has us. Isn't that just amazing? You know, we're busy with this prayer of Jesus, which is kind of the real Lord's prayer. The other one was for us. This is his prayer for us. The other gave to us. So this is how you should pray. This is what he prayed for us. And we we looked at and he went to his father and he instructed us to do the same. He said, pray to your father who's in heaven. But he goes further than that and he says, Lord, protect them. And we saw that last week. And if you never got that, listen to it. Because it's really I think it's so important that we get the heart of God for us. Because when you, if you want to know what God's heart is for you, just listen to what he prays for you. Makes sense, doesn't it? If you lo- want to know your heart for you, listen to what you pray for you. So you kind of stop and you, you go, oh, wait, what am I praying for me? I'm praying for, oh, Lord, give me money. Money, money, money. Give me comfort. Remove those people. They're, they, they're difficult for me. Do this, Lord, do that. Lord, this is what I'm really praying for, breakthrough in this area. <laughs> but what does Jesus pray for you? Let, let's get some of his heart. And when we get to that, that day of prayer and fasting, I want to actually encourage us to use the framework of this prayer for our praying for City Hill Church. And we're going to start to protect us. There's things like, uh, today I'm going, sanctify, he prays, sanctify them. He prays, unify them. He prays, multiply them. there's, There's things he prays for us that we can pray for us. Because it's the heart of God for us. And it's, we can be safe in that. Because he, j- 
the perfect Son of God prayed that for us. It w- there was no sin tainting his prayerfulness. <laughs> his prayers were pure. And here we get to, to stand and we go, what, what do we pray for each other? Or, hey, why do we pray for City Hill Church? This is what we pray. And I, I, just, I want to encourage you in that. But I'm going to read this because um, as we do this, I think what the one thing we've got to see is that the church belongs to Jesus. It's his church. He says, the Father has given it to me and it belongs to the Father and it belongs to the Son. We are his. You're not your own. You've been bought with a price. And that's fundamental in this whole thing is we belong to him, so let's live that out. Let's live like we do. And so as we belong to him, he's praying for that which belongs to him, that he cares deeply about, that he died for, that he, he paid the price of his own life for, so that you can have the forgiveness of sins and eternal life in Jesus Christ. And he prays for you. So I'm going to just start from verse, uh, where, where am I going? From verse 9 down to verse 19. And he says this, I pray for them. I'm not praying for the world, but for those you have given me because they are yours. See? Everything I have is yours and everything you have is mine and I'm glorified in them and that's in you. So he's saying, you, you're mine. I'm, this is all about him. I'm no longer in the world, but they are in the world. And I'm coming to you, Holy Father. Protect them by your name that you have given me so that they may be one as we are one. While I was with them, I was protecting them by your name that you have given me. I guarded them, and not one of them is lost except the son of destruction, so that the scripture may be fulfilled. Now I'm I'm coming to you, and I speak these things in the world so that they may have my joy completed in them. This, this, this is why God is here. The, co- the completion of his joy in you. I've given them your word. The world hated them because they are not of the world and I'm not of the world. I'm not praying that you take them out of the world but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world as just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them by the truth. This is what I'm looking at today. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I have also sent them into the world. I sanctify myself for them so they, so that they also may be sanctified by the truth. What a great prayer for us. Very encouraging. You know, that looking at that verse 17, it's in the context of something that you a characteristic of every believer, because verse 16 highlights this when it says they are not of the world just as I am not of the world. Like there's this, something, we are not of this world. We are in this world. And Jesus says that repeat, repeatedly, but we are not of this world. W- this world does not define you. It's interesting how often we want this world to define us and give us definition, give us the boundaries with, that give us definition. But you're not defined by this world. And uh, my guess is even if you're wrestling through stuff in your own inner be- life, uh, it may be because you're letting the world define who you are rather than being defined by who Jesus says you are. This world does not define us. You know, we've... We are part of another kingdom under author- uh, the authority of a better king, and that should be what defines us. We, you've been bought, I've said that today, where you've, you've been transferred from the kingdom of darkness and you've been brought into the kingdom of light, the kingdom of God's Son. And he's the king. And this is why this prayer is so relevant for us, because it's what, what does it mean to be people who have gone, been taken from there to there and being brought from darkness into light, being brought from the kingdom of uh, uh, Satan, where he's trying to rule and he's an imposter, to the kingdom of light where Jesus is king, and he rules, he reigns, and he says, this is what's right and what's good for you. There's a difference, you know. You know, when you move countries, as uh, many of you have in this room, you're going, 
uh, we're going to put ourselves under a different authority when I come into a different place. You, you're no longer under the authority that you were I under before. You're under a new authority. But here, this is a good authority. This is the best authority. This is pure. There's no corruption in him. There's no sin tainting him. And so when he brings you into the, under his authority, we bow to his lordship because that's good. And we don't have to fear that. We don't have to fear that, oh, well, the king is bad. That will never be said of Jesus. It can never be said of uh, God our Father that he is bad. Every earthly king fails, don't they? There's never been a time when there's been perfection in, in government, ever. Not earthly government. But this is where he shows his desire for the believer. And it's simply this. Sanctify them. They're not of this world. I want you to sanctify them. It's an expression of the Father's heart, of the, the Son's heart. Because he and the Father are one. So when you get the Son's heart, you get the Father's heart. So when he says sanctify them, he's, he's really praying, Lord, sanctify them. This is the area of our conflict in our heart. This is the area that we fight with a lot. Yes. I'll get onto that. It's a good question because and I think that that's exactly uh, the right question to ask because we often use words and terms that like we, we throw out and we read in the word, but we need to know what it means. And I'm going to get onto that in a second. Because Romans 8 tells us that part of God's plan for us is that he's going to conform us into the image of his son. So when he those he predestined, he, those are the ones he plans to conform to the image of Jesus. There's a change. That means we weren't before in the image of Jesus. We weren't carrying that before, but now... We are, and the desire for God is to have us sanctified. Just hold on to that word, sanctified. And that's the thing that puts us into conflict with the flesh, the world, and the devil. So what does it mean? I'm glad you asked, Fiona. <laughs> There's four things I want to I just say this means for us. And it's the four simple things, and I'll, I'll put them like uh, just in these four things, and then if there needs more clarity, I'll give that. So the first thing is, is he's praying. When he prays, sanctify them. He's saying, prepare them. Prepare them. Make us more ready for our home. See, that if this world is not our home, he's praying, Lord, Father, make them ready for their home because uh, we are otherworldly people this world is where we don't settle here and it's so easy to settle here right sometimes we just want to go man this is this is all that we can see this is what we embrace and we go let's just make this the place of our comfort there's a better place in, in 1 Peter 2 verse 9 to 12 we're given some indication of this just look at this you are a chosen race. That's what you are. A royal priesthood. A holy nation. A people of, for his possession so that you may proclaim the praises of the one who, what? Called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, now you are God's people. See the, the transition that's gone? Through? You have not received mercy. You, uh, you had not received mercy, now you have received mercy. Dear friends, he says, I urge you. And this is what characterizes us as strangers and exiles. The better, the sooner we get that in our life, the better it will be for us in our Christian walk. That we know that I'm a stranger, I'm an exile here. So even though my, my political realm in this world says this is how I should 
live, and there are laws that govern that. Sometimes I live by a higher law that if this law breaks that law, I obey that law and not this law because I'm an exile here. I'm a stranger here. We need to adopt the posture of strangers and exiles in this world because this isn't our home. And it says, dear friends, I urge you, strangers and exiles to abstain from sinful desires that wage war against the soul. Conduct yourselves honorably among the Gentiles so that when they slander you as evildoers, they will observe your good works and glorify God on the day he visits. You see, we have got a home that we are being made ready for. And that home means that we, God wants to transform us wants to work in us that that's going to be easy you know something that's interesting I, I think God wants to work in us that when he comes and takes us home that transition is not going to be so big he, he wants it to so when he returns and takes us home because that's, that's home that's heaven and what does home look like it's a place of purity. It's a place of holiness. It's a place that is uh, filled with the glory and the excellences of God. Now, holiness is a place for the person who is carnal in their hearts and minds and spirits and just like worldly in every way. Holiness is a terrifying place to be in. But for the Christ follower, God wants to make us ready for a place that the transition is not so bad. We don't have anything to fear. We have been justified. We stand in that. And now when we say we are being sanctified, there's a simple definition for sanctify them. Make them into what they already are in Christ. So he's wanting us to become in, in this world ready for the next by changing us into what we already are. Because there's no justice, there's no um, condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So we don't fear the, that place. But man, sometimes we need to just embrace, this is what God is doing, make me ready for it. See, you and I are not meant to settle here. I mean, you can buy a house, that's fine buy a car but if all if everything in your life is defined by this world there's a problem my comfort I think it's why you know if God has made us eternal beings we have this deep sense of eternity in our heart everyone has it that's why even people who don't want to believe in God fear something of death the unknown I don't know. So the first thing is prepare them. The second thing is grow them. When he prays, sanctify them, he's praying, grow them, and that's simply more into the reality of what they are already. You are saints. Have you thought about that, saints? Do you know what the word saint means? Come on, saints. It means holy one. <laughs> You're a holy one. Uh, can you believe that? That's what the Bible says we are. You know, it's not some kind of office that uh, the church or like, oh, I'm going to pick a couple of saints this year. These are the people we're going to uh, like put up there. No, you, why? Uh, you are the saints because God has made you holy in Christ Jesus. You have been justified by faith. He looks at you. The Father looks at you as if you've never sinned. You've, he's looked at you. And he's wiped you, you're the sin out. He's cleaned. He looks at you through Jesus Christ, through, the, through what Christ has done for you. And he says, that's who you are. Now we need to learn. How do we, this is interesting. To sanctify is to help us grow into that reality. I'm going to become more and more what I already am. The third thing is purify them cleanse and make holy. You know, it's something 
this is perhaps the harder part for us as he makes us more like Jesus. And that's such an int- like a heart work that he's doing. He's working in us to make us hate sin more and love righteousness much more. And if we don't know how much that is, he's, what he's teaching us is as we learn to hate sin, it's like he's revealing more and more of the depth of that to us. Saying, no, we, we get it. Okay, I, I, I'm not committing adultery. I'm not doing that. And then he shows us something. He takes a layer off and he says, look at, look at your heart. Look at the covetousness there and the envy. Look at the, look at the, the bitterness that's there. Let's, let's deal with that. Then he, he, he lay, takes those layers off and it just he keeps showing us because this is a work of God in our lives until he returns or takes us home. It's a, a constant. In the Psalms, we're called to worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. a glorious place of joy and wonder for the one who has their heart after God. And the fourth thing is consecrate them. So the four things are prepare them, grow them, purify them. Fourth thing is consecrate them, set them apart for a holy purpose. Jesus says here, I sanctify myself for them. Did you see that? It's an interesting thing. Jesus was holy. He didn't need to be made holy. He didn't need to, uh, you know, he, he didn't need to grow more in his holiness. He, he was holy. But it was consecrated. He had set himself for a holy purpose, the purpose of being your Savior. I sanctify myself for them. I set myself apart. Every one of you has a holy utensil at home. That's true. Your toothbrush. That is set apart for you. I think. (laughs) Well, while nobody else is in my house, as long as Jenny's away and Stephen's not not around, anybody else is around, my, my toothbrush can be used by anyone. But when everybody else returns, it's only for me. Because when they're away, nobody else is around to use it. So it's, it's always for me. It's my, my, my holy utensil that's set apart for my use. And there's a sense in which God is saying, uh, Jesus said, I, say, I set myself apart for you, to serve you, to, to show love to you. But I'm calling you to be set apart for me. I think there's something of this coming out today in our, our talks and our, in this place. God is saying, I want to set you apart for my purposes. But here's the thing. That what is the means God has been ordained for us to be sanctified? And this is, this is important. He says, sanctify them by the truth. I think there's some way um, that this, this resonates, it must resonate in our hearts. So, uh, as I was thinking of this, I took out Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2, where it says this, Therefore, brothers and sisters, in view of the mercies of God, I urge you to present your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. See, holy, I, I want you to put yourself apart. Your body, you are meant to be holy and pleasing to God. This is your true worship. We're saying, Lord, take me. Take my everything around me. Then he says, do not be conformed to this age, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may discern what is good and pleasing and per- the perfect will of God. No, the, the truth is a tool God uses to renew our mind. How else do you become discerning unless you know this truth? You can't discern apart from truth. There's no ways you can be discerning apart from truth. The truth begins to saturate your mind. And as that does, your mind is renewed and you learn to discern discern what is the good, pleasing, and perfect will of God. 
Truth is the tool God uses to renew your mind. Then he goes on, he says, your word is truth. I think there's a play on words in this. Because if you know John chapter 1 and verse 1, of course you all know John chapter 1 and verse 1, right? Yeah. In the beginning was the word. And the word was with God, and the word was God. It's interesting. It's a play on words there. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God, and the word was God. There's something, the word refers to a person. Jesus. He was with God, and he was God. He was there in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and this life was the life of men. So there at the beginning was the truth, the word. And he was God, and he was God in flesh. So there's that. I think there's a second thing, though. Is the word is the revealed and recorded word of God, the Bible. So we have, this is what God has spoken. As we believe this. God has spoken, and here we have all that we need for what God has spoken. There's no new revelation. So even if we talk around prophetic, we don't look at the prophetic as a substitute for this. There's no one who gives something new that's going to be coming into the canon of scriptures, into added to this book. There's nothing new that is needed. This is all we need. But we have it because this is the recorded word of God. And, this, and then there's the evidence of the truth in us because 1 John 5 verse 6 calls the Holy Spirit the truth and the Holy Spirit living in us is revealing himself through the truth that is planted in our hearts and becomes manifest through our lives in the things like discernment, in the way we live, in the way we speak. So even feeling that those tensions like, oh, God's changed me. He's worked in my heart that people see the difference that he's made in me. That's the work of the Holy Spirit, taking truth, bringing it to bear in our hearts and bringing it, manifesting it through our lives. Do you get that? But there's also prioritizing of the word here. Because this word points to the living word, Jesus. And he gives clarity. He's done the word is truth. The word of God works deep in our hearts. And when it does, the truth saturates us, our hearts and our minds. And so the Holy Spirit begins to take that and he and brings that water of the spirit over it that brings a flourishing you know when you think of a farmer a farmer doesn't just watch his field like okay i'm a farmer now let's say i get a field i've got the field and i sit back and watch and wait for the crops to grow it's not going to happen unless i first plowed put the seed in and actively water this and this is it for us as well. You know, I think I'm looking at this and I'm going, there's two things for us. One is, this is putting the responsibility on us. You want to grow more like Jesus. You can't do it apart from the Word. This Word saturates the soul, prepares the ground for, for the harvest. And, the, and, you know, we don't bring that crop. We don't produce that. God does that, but we've got to prepare the, the, our hearts. I, I just find it strange that Christians can go day after day, week after week without this in their heart and think, I'm going to grow up into a holy person. See, this is, we need the word. It revives our soul. The word stirs us, it shapes us. We get this word into us. I, I don't know about you, but do you ever feel like I've been reading the Bible, reading the Bible. I'm not getting anything from God today. You, you know, I've, I've tried over time to be reading for many, many years, and I'm still doing it. Uh, I read through the Bible at least once a year. And, and as I, I do that, I mean, there's sections of this that are dead boring, it feels. And as I'm reading that, it's, it's like, why, why am I even reading this? Should I? And there's names, and, you know, it just seems... 
But then I start to think, what is God wanting to say to me in that? People matter. And every name that I read speaks about somebody somewhere. Every name that I read reminds me that the Father that the Father is actively involved in our story. And even though it may feel so boring, it's from whose perspective? Because when I shift my view, and it's not just about me, it's about Him, I start to find meaning in God's story. And I start to think, oh wow, God is I think I also want to encourage you. I, I'm, I'm not going to say you must go read the Bible in a year. But read it. If, if you, you're struggling to get it, and you're struggling to make sense of it, well, push on, read it. Start by asking God, show me yourself. As I open this book today, I want to see you today. It's not all about you. About him. Go back. Let God work in you. I want to tell you something. If you commit to doing that, even for five or ten minutes a day, you're going to start to have changed perspective, changed thinking. And when you've come to difficult times, and I think Wayne, this really, it was that first day, he sent me a message, sent Psalm 73, and I read it in church. You know, who have I in heaven but you? There's nothing on earth that I desire besides you. My heart and my flesh may fail, but you are the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Where does that come from? I know he reads the word. My friend, let that week come and let that encourage me. My heart and my flesh may fail. You are the strength of my heart. My portion forever. You've got to be in the Word to get there. Let's encourage each other. I want to encourage you. You know, maybe you, your habit is to get up too early or too late to do this. Well, get up a bit earlier. Set your alarm every day. You don't have to spend an hour. You might grow to that. But spend time. And spend time with the Father he speaks. And because he speaks, we can listen. You see, because when we get the word, there's room, that ground of our heart has been, that ground has been plowed, the seed is being sown, and there's room for God to produce through us. And that's what he does, because God's spirit works, taking what's put there, and he brings life to us. Big story. Big. You see, the word of God w is uh, transforms those who welcome it. The Psalm seven, 19, verse 7, just says, I mean, it's just, a, 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 I think I've got it up there. Hey? The instruction of the Lord is perfect. I mean, is this, this is a psalmist, is it David, that, that he's just going, oh, this word, the instruction of the Lord is perfect, renewing one's life. Don't you want renewal? Well, dig into the instruction. The testimony of the Lord is trustworthy, making the inexperienced wise. Don't you want wisdom? Get in the word. The precepts of the Lord are right, making the heart glad. Don't you want gladness of heart? Get in the word. The command of the Lord is radiant, making the eyes light up. Don't you want your eyes to be lit up? Wow. Get in the word. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The ordinances of the Lord are reliable and altogether righteous. They are more desirable than gold, than an abundance of pure gold, and sweeter than honey dripping from a honeycomb. If your experience of reading the word doesn't have that, ask God to give it to you. 
In addition, your servant is warned by them. And in keeping them, there is abundant reward. Amen. Reward. You know, I stand before you today as a guy like, my job is this book. That's my job. My job is to communicate it, to help you apply it. But I'm, before that's my job, that's what I need to do in my own heart. I've got to be wrestling through this. You know, uh, uh, one of the biggest criticisms of like uh, Bible college students is that it becomes a textbook. And it's not just simply a textbook, it's a living word of God. And I, I, I want to keep coming here not to prepare a sermon, but to feed my soul. And I get up in the morning and I go and, and I begin to eat. And it is so often sweet for me. Because I need it. Sometimes it's, you know, food isn't always sweet. But if it lands, I get those. But I don't stop eating and go, eh, that never filled me today. There's enough. Funny how we are in this world. I was like, oh, it's been so hard to, to do the, like, to have a quiet time. I'm just going to stop. Like, you know, when we skip a meal, Oh, wow, I'm so useless. Why did I skip a meal? I'm never going to eat again. <laughs> no, we pick it up next time round, and we just go straight back because we know it's good for us. And this is what I do. This is what we need to do. See, when I stand, I preach, and Paul speaks the word. If there's a time when the truth is not going to be palatable for the Hearer, preach the word. When a time when the people will oppose the, the, what the truth is, preach the word. When, when people don't like what I'm saying, preach the word. Because if it's the word, I don't care if you don't like what I'm saying. I want you to like what the Spirit of God is saying in the word. Let's do this. Church, I want to. We're praying. Lord, set a fire down in my soul that I can't contain, that I can't control. I want to tell you something. God's not going to do that apart from this. This is going to stir them. Understand who God is. Know Him. Longing for you in our lives. Pray, Father, for us, hunger for you, that we know that you alone can fill us. Fill us. Lord, we look at a scripture like this and see Jesus praying for us. Sanctify them and sanctify them by the truth. Your word is. I want to pray that you would do something in City Hill Church. Creating such a hunger for you.